Excellency, thank you so much for joining CNBC. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Hadley. I want to kick off by asking you to walk us through what this IMF package is going to look like and what it actually means for Jordan. This package was designed 100% in Jordan, and it focuses on achieving two objectives. Number one, uh, reigniting growth to generate jobs for our unemployed. Uh, and to do that, uh, we are doing a deep restructuring of the uh, inputs for, uh, uh, for business, uh, energy, labor markets, access to finance, and, uh, and real estate. Uh, in addition to uh, improving the governance, including the fiscal governance and transparency in Jordan. That's objective number one. Objective number two is to broaden the tax base and to increase the revenue collection by uh, fighting tax evasion and tax avoidance, not by raising tax rates. And that's a key hallmark of this four-year program. When you think about this a bit more broadly, um, this was a long time in coming, and it required some serious structural reform and some tightening of the belt that did get some pushback from the public. How do you expect the public to take these measures over the longer term? Well, the key differential this time is that this program was designed 100% by Jordanian hands. We own it, and we designed it to address the key inhabitants of the challenging situation in the economy. So that you're not going to push people beyond what they can take? That is not the plan. The plan is to focus on growth positive or growth neutral measures. However, we will come down hard on tax avoidance and evasion, which is only fair and will have a popular support because it's only fair that everybody pitches in. Um, uh, in addition, the previous structural reforms really uh, uh, came uh, uh, very handy. Jordan this year ranked as the top uh, reformer in the ease of doing business. We had a 29 jump uh, uh, in our rank. We were ranked number fourth in financial inclusion in the ease of doing business. So we are really t coming from a strong base to push growth uh, uh, reforms going forward. When you think about what could potentially happen to derail or challenge what you're trying to do and what Jordan so desperately needs, um, one of the things that we've been talking about over the last couple of days and the last couple of months now is the coronavirus and how damaging that could potentially be to the global economy. How do you see that playing out with regards to what you're trying to do? So the coronavirus was, uh, was pretty much mentioned in every talk today at the G20 meetings. It is a real concern and it will dampen the projections for growth. Uh, however, uh, the projections I heard so far will look like a, a, a V-shaped curve. That is, there will be a, a, a downturn, but then it will pick up uh, quickly, at least we hope. And, and at the heart of it, this is a humanitarian crisis where the first concern really is to make sure that people's safety is really uh, maintained and balanced. However, the second concern I have is regional instability. With the regional circumstances uh, uh, where they are, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, turbulence in Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, it is paramount that Jordan maintains its resilience to regional turbulence by continuing its structural reform, by continuing the export of services. Uh, when we export services such as coding, which we are now, we're really uh, resilient to closure of borders. Uh, we can engage in global markets without physically having to be uh, interconnected with them, which is an approach that we have taken to ensure that Jordan continues this path of socioeconomic stability and resilience. Walk me through how you see this playing out in the sense that today we've understood that Iran has discovered more cases and that the Iran-Iraq border has been closed. Obviously, Iraq, a major trading partner, um, and in the last few years post-ISIS, um, they've really been trying to, to re-engage with Jordan. That's an important partner for you guys. How worrying is it that you're seeing the spread potentially of coronavirus uh, so quickly across the region? Re-engaging with Iraq is a top priority for us. We spent a good chunk of time last year uh, re-engaging with Iraq, reopening the market, uh, signing interconnectivity of electricity with Iraq, uh, an oil pipeline. Uh, the potential is massive for uh, uh, this relationship. And if anything, the, 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 the unfortunate situation in the coronavirus highlights the importance uh, for Iraq uh, uh, and Jordan to diversify their import and export markets. For Iraq, it's really important to have a westward uh, uh, market uh, supply uh, in Jordan uh, for its power, for its commodities, for its services. And we believe, if anything, this most recent scare, which ultimately we hope everybody comes out of it uh, uh, safely, uh, highlights the importance for Iraq to diversify uh, uh, its markets uh, and highlights the importance for Jordan really to double down on opening up to uh, the rest of the region and to the rest of the world. Uh, this year we opened up 22 FDI, uh, 22 sectors for FDI. 
uh, again, uh, we're really active in diversification uh, uh, of our services and merchandise. On the coronavirus, it is a, it is a global scare, and uh, nobody really can project forward uh, where this is headed. Uh, the key thing for the region, for Jordan, for, uh, uh, for other countries which have witnessed this care, is to have their precautionary plans uh, uh, well in, in, in ahead and to diversify your supply chains to ensure that you're not getting cut off when this hits. Because it isn't the only time that you've had to really step back and try to figure that Iraq relationship out, frankly, because over the last months before coronavirus, you had the massive protests against the government and against the, the cut, frankly, in services. Iraq is seriously a cautionary tale when it comes to what happens when the government isn't able to provide for its citizens the basics of infrastructure, like electricity and like water. Um, when you take a step back there and think about what happens next with regards to the region, you also have a significant worry uh, to, in Lebanon when it comes to the financial crisis in that country. You've taken major steps to connect with the IMF, to work on a plan for Jordan, as you say, that's specific to your needs. What advice do you have for a country like Lebanon, uh, which is in the midst of a financial crisis and doesn't seem as yet to have a plan? I'll start with Jordan, then I'll segue to Lebanon. Uh, the past decade for Jordan has been a tale of what doesn't kill you, make you stronger. We witnessed uh, exogenous shocks worth 44% of our GDP. We came from it stronger. We, our entire energy supply was cut off uh, when the revolution hit Egypt. Uh, as we saw our, our supply of natural gas get completely cut off. Uh, now we generate 20% of our electricity from renewable. At that time, zero. So that taught us to diversify and to be resilient. Uh, same thing with our export market. The same period we also witnessed 1.3 million Red Syrian refugees enter Jordan, which we welcomed, opened our schools and, and, and hospitals and, and services to. Again, uh, uh, Jordan has been a tale of responding to sudden exogenous shocks, and that's what I think makes Jordan attractive for investors, because you can count on the return, but also you can count on a quick institutional response to unforeseen shocks. Now to Lebanon. Uh, uh, what we have learned uh, through the past few years is there is no uh, alternative to doing deep structural reform and to building so social uh, uh, consensus on that reform. Uh, uh, Lebanon is, is, is a dear brother and a dear neighbor, and uh, ultimately the well-being of Lebanon and Iraq is part of the well-being of Jordan. Uh, what I hope is Lebanon can come together uh, uh, to identify its own structure reform. Structure reform can only happen if the country fully adopts it and builds consensus on it. You cannot push it from abroad. You cannot push it uh, 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 without an institutional support. Uh, I think uh, Lebanon uh, will come through. Uh, uh, Lebanon has always come through, and uh, uh, the well-being of Lebanon will be important for the stability of the region. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, I believe uh, Jordan over the past few years and Jordan going forward is a beacon of stability in, in a region that investors can really access the entire re uh, region, plus FTAs with the U.S., Europe, and the Arab world from Jordan, which makes us really attractive pushing forward. When you just spoke about the 20% of renewables when it comes to your energy supply, uh, this was a program that I discussed with His Majesty not too many years ago. One of the questions I would have then, given the coronavirus and what we've seen that do to energy markets in terms of the price of oil, lower oil prices, it's a double-edged sword in a sense for Jordan, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, it means potentially less money coming from abroad from those who are working in the GCC countries, but at the same point, it means lower prices. How do you see that playing out this year for Jordan? Indeed. Um, Are lower oil prices good for the country? Again, it's, uh, it's good uh, for the balance of payment. It could be uh, bad for the transfers. It could be bad for regional uh, cross-country investments. What's a good price? Are we talking 60 to 70? That's the price that we're building our uh, anticipation and, uh, and budgeting on. Uh, again, uh, it's a double-sorted edge. Having said that, if there is one lesson to be learned from this and from previous crises is interconnectivity with the region, interconnectivity of electricity, interconnectivity of fuel supply markets. And Jordan now is in a very good spot to turn energy from a previous handicap into a potential uh, asset and hub. We've seen the price of generating solar electricity in Jordan drop from 
cents a kilowatt to 2.4 US cents a kilowatt, one of the lowest prices on earth in a span of four years. And the potential is massive there. And we will continue to exploit this potential going forward to lower the cost of doing business and to increase the profitability for investors. One of the other big questions, of course, facing the region today um, is the deal of the century that was purported at least to be able to unlock 50 billion, not just for the Palestinians, but for also uh, neighboring countries as well, including Jordan, as much as seven and a half billion, I believe. When you take a step back and think about the needs of Jordanians and the need to get the country back on track, it, to your mind, is this um, a selling point for the plan that Jordan could receive this kind of a handout? You cannot put a price on a real, political, fair, and sustainable resolution to, the, to, to this issue. You cannot put a price on it or you cannot buy it. That has to come first and then everything else follows. That has been the position of Jordan. And what Jordan says publicly, it says in closed rooms on, on, on that. We welcome any push to achieve a fair and sustainable peace for the Palestinians and for the entire region. But that is non-negotiable and you cannot buy it. So you won't be bought off. I don't think anybody is looking to buy anybody off, uh, uh, but to our population, the fundamentals are clear and they are not negotiable. When you think about what happens next with regards to the Syrian situation, obviously Jordan, as you mentioned, has been hosting um, over a million people for quite a long time. And this is on top of the Palestinians that you were already hosting um, as a donor nation. When you think about what happens next, given the fact that we are now seeing continued conflict in Syria between the Russians and now the Turks. It seems as if this is unfortunately a never-ending kind of conflict. As finance minister, how do you bank all of this in? Because you have donor fatigue internationally, you've got to worry about your own population in terms of job growth. What happens to these people? Um, I'm glad you raised this. As, as you said, the Syrian crisis is no longer in the headlines of newspapers, but it is our reality day in, day out. Uh, last year, we saw that fatigue reflected in lower uh, uh, commitments that has been delivered to Jordan as part of the pledges that have been previously made. Uh, uh, having said that, Jordan decided that it will be an international global public uh, a giver. We opened our doors to 1.3 million. When, when women and children show up at your door, His Majesty decided you let them in and you worry about the details later. And this is what we've been doing. We opened our schools to them. Jordan is running now 240 schools in double shifts to accommodate the refugees. 90% of the refugees are outside of refugee camps competing for very small uh, uh, number of jobs that are being created. How do you address that on the ground? Because obviously that does cause a great deal of discomfort amongst the local population. It has to be an all boats must rise strategy. Whatever we do has to address both the community and the refugees. It is a testament to Jordanians that we have seen zero xenophobia coming out and we have seen high amounts of tolerance and welcoming them into the hospitals, into the workplace, into the communities. But the world should not count on that. This crisis is way bigger than the size of Jordan. We've seen bigger countries such as Germany and the US really suffer in figuring out a solution to the refugees they've, they've, they've welcomed, which is a fraction of what Jordan welcomed. It is a reminder for the world, you cannot take Jordan's welcoming of the refugees for granted. We will do it because we believe in it. But Jordan needs the international support to continue to come in in order for it to fulfill this role on behalf of the world. What should that look like? Do you think is that direct financial aid or is that within the you know, broader outlook of the UN? What could you get from the international community, particularly the West specifically in terms of support today? It's multifaceted. From, uh, from governments, we need direct support. We need grants and we need uh, concessional financing. That Both are equally important. We need to lower our cost of borrowing, so all of the above is going to be helpful. From the private sector, investments. We need FDI and don't come to Jordan to support Jordan. Come to Jordan because it's a good place to do business. You can code at a lower cost than East Europe and at a lower turnover than India. You can access some of the highest educated labor in, 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 in the world, frankly. 60% of our female labor force uh, have university degrees and higher. But also you come to Jordan to do good. It's good CSR, it's good for your bottom line, but it's simply good business and good by itself. Is there a number? Off. 
is there a number, if you were to, to go to the international community and say, you know, this is a burden on Jordan, we're willing to do as much as we can, but we need your help, especially at a time we're in, we're in the middle of an IMF program, and, and given all of the constraints in the region and the worries in the region, is there a number that you would take to the UN, to the, to the United States, and say, hey, listen, we'll, we'll help you carry the bag here, but you've got to help us too? Jordan developed the Jordan Response Plan to the Syrian crisis, which highlights exactly the cost Jordan has been carrying to continue with this. The number is out there, it's public, and countries have been committing to it. The issue is not putting a number. The issue is translating the pledges into actual commitments that take place with Jordan. That is my biggest concern, is countering the fatigue. This problem is there, and we need to address it without turning an eye and worrying about the next crisis. The world is full of crises, unfortunately, coronavirus and others. But this is a whole generation that has been roaming the region and found a safe haven in Jordan. We need that population, we need that young generation to grow up safely in order for them to have a bright future away from extremism and away from instability. This is not a localized problem. This is a worldwide problem, and the response has to be a worldwide solution. It is beyond the scale of Jordan. For the private sector, yes, you have a role to play, and you don't have to sacrifice your bottom line to play it. You can come and do good business and do good for the world. I encourage you to come, spend a couple of hours in Jordan, and see if the next investment you do abroad, Jordan could be the destination for it, and you'll be surprised. We've seen Expedia set up one of their five coding offices worldwide in Jordan. They have the highest female-to-male ratio coders in Jordan out of their entire world office uh, uh, presence. I mean, over 10,000 babies in the camps at Satra when I was there um, not too long ago. Uh, they were born there since um, the start of the Syrian crisis. Do you worry that those children are not going to have a future? I worry that those children will not see a bright future in front of them. And it's not because Jordan is not going to offer it. It's because the resources of Jordan are simply not enough. But I also worry about the communities that they're in. I worry about the Jordanian kids who are growing up and sharing the small desk space with the Syrians having the same, same education. I worry about the Jordanian youth who are not finding employment and the world is not turning uh, to, to, to support them. I worry about all of that. Having said that, Jordan is entering its centennial this uh, uh, next year. And the story of Jordan over the past centennial has been surviving against all odds and prospering against all odds. We learned how to turn a challenge into opportunity, such as the renewable example I mentioned to you, such as when our physical borders with Iraq and Syria closed, we turned into exporting coding services with a click of a button. That has been the story of Jordan. I'm not worried about it, but I believe the world has a role to play and they can count on the goodwill of the governments and the profitability-seeking investments that should come to Jordan. Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, thank you for having me.